one or two weeks after trials, we weren't notified about who made the team, when the team is traveling. Literally one to two weeks before the team traveled, we were being notified. I have a problem with that. Why? If you don't tell anybody what's going on, what do you think is going to happen? Their performance might be hindered because they took off a month, couple weeks. That's time I could have used to like stay in shape and everybody was talking about it, but no one said anything. Because to, to the injury point, I've had a few people that I know personally talk about, um, they wanted to go into certain sports. Mm -hmm. And when they found out like getting covered under the school's insurance was a bit hard to do because they were international. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they had to like drop out because if they had a severe injury, mm -hmm. they would have to come out of their pocket mm -hmm. first because the university would only be able to cover up to a certain amount. It's, it's pointless if you're allowing female athletes in competition to compete in a sports bra and tights or sports bra and buns. Does anybody know what buns is? No, no, no. It looks like underwear. It's pretty much a... Oh. Hold on, so why do they call it buns? Well, I don't... You I guys don't. are showing your buns? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Fanatic Island. This is your home for sports and sports entertainment. And today, we have another soundbar set down. Yes, I know, you know, we the episodes have been a little slow recently. Some went out to outer space slash China, but they're back. No, it's not Kadeem. But okay. nevertheless, we progress. But today we have Tamara with us. She is the current outdoor record holder for Triple Jump. She went to the University of Arkansas on a track and field scholarship. Go Razorbacks. She went to the yeah, World yeah, Championship yeah. in London in 2017. She, went, she also went to the Pan America Championships in Peru. She's been all over. She currently trains at home with um, renowned coach James Rowe. And right now, she's currently aiming to qualify for the 2024 Olympics. So she's doing big things. Anything you want to say to the people at home? Firstly, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so apparently, right, I'm going to try to be as professional, respectful as possible. Um, but there are a few things some of the athletes want to um, say through me, of course. Um, hopefully one or two of them can make an appearance, but um, saying everybody, saying hi to everybody back in Andres and um, my training partners in Leap of Faith. Um, so let's get started. Obviously Prince is here, Macario's here, Justin's behind the scenes working the ones and twos and the threes and the fours and the cameras and everything. But let's go, who, who, who up first? I mean, you know, I want to ask you about your event. How is it that you got into such a technical event in track and field, triple jump? Um, so back in high school, um, my physical education teacher at the time, Gonzalo Kane, um, he's passed away now. Um, basically going through track and field, um, um, the events. And so we got the triple jump. He asked everybody to go one at a time. I'm very competitive, playing my family. Um, so I went. I finally did really good. He asked me to go again. And so that year, I tried out for the Corrupted team. I was 13, the youngest on that team that traveled to um, Turks and Caicos. And so it's been, I've been doing triple jump ever since. Wow. How does it feel being um, a part of the, the feel event? You know, some people look at it as the least glamorous side of the whole yeah. track and feel. I feel like, I mean, I say this as a big guy, what I used to be able to do is like throw a shot, but sometimes discus, but I'm not the form for discus. I, I, a little uncoordinated. So how did it feel um, being on the field events? Like how did it kind of affect your focus or was it just like you and your lane and you knew what it was? No, you know, um, we get a lot of love um, for field events. So if you, you have some jumpers that are hype jumpers. And so the crowd really gets in with them to help them um, compete. I'm not really a hype jumper. I try to get the clap once in a while. But I think for field events, we really need more love in terms of um, broadcasting time and airtime. Because we go to major world championships, you always see the track. It's the track. If a, if a long jump or triple jump is on, don't let the 100 or 200 or 1,500 meters or maybe the 5,000 come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're cutting it off. That's <laughs> it. You, you will not see yeah. anything else. You have to go literally go to live results to see like what's going on. And so that's the only thing I would wish that would change in terms of yeah, time on TV. I get, okay. I guess with knowing all of that, why? what made you want to continue with triple jump? Um, I think it's probably one of 
the only things I'm good at besides that in long jump. So wow, I love it. Um, and so I don't have a hate relationship with it other than, like I said, the airtime. It is one of the technical and hardest events for a female um, to participate in. And so I think, um, cause I don't know if a lot of people know this, but females at one point in time could not triple jump because of the, you know, the impact on the body. And so to be able to do it now, I feel privileged. And so I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. All right. So would you have um, any kind of words for those who would be interested in track and field and not necessarily like the fastest because, you know, everybody want to think I, I got to do the cross country in school or I got to like run the sprints. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you kind of get them or get them towards like some of the field events? Because they might have the strengths there, like they have the power and the legs mm -hmm. to, to make the runs. You just don't make the times. Like, how do you transition from that into possibly jumping? That's that's a good question because I actually started as a, as a sprinter, um, running the one, two, and the four. Ooh. Thank God I found. That's an interesting combination. <laughs> yeah, triple because you know a lot of a lot of sprinters they do the four hundred for like um to build strength or whatever, yeah. and so then they go down to their main event. And so mm. I did the one, two, and four in in high school. Then transitioned the triple jump, which saved my life because I don't know if you've ever seen the workouts for sprinting events. I'm just glad I'm not doing that anymore. I don't know but, y'all have arms um, rings. <laughs> no arms rings, no long capacity. No I know. Um, for a lot of it, um, you build, your jumpers are really strong. And so I think I, I think that's why a lot of people get shocked when they see a jumper sprinting or coming out of the blocks for a relay. Um, you build strength. And I, I feel like um, it's, there's a lot of good things happening in the, in the field events. And so I encourage anybody that wants to try it. Um, while especially while they're young, because you get to test out different things until you find your um, your specialty, and that's what I did, and so I stuck with it. Like I said, since then. All right. No mm -hmm. attempt with the hurdles or high jump. Oh no. Mm -mm. You didn't try it out? Nope. Nope. No, Mom, not you at might all. Have been amazing. I, I admire them people. I, <laughs> I I love to watch it, but I ain't doing it. Okay. Mm -mm. You heard it here, folks. If you want to find your niche, you got to explore different things. Explore all the events, any event possible. See where your strength lies. I mean, same thing when it comes to regular sports. If you can't shoot a basketball to save your life, maybe you may be good at basketball, volleyball. If you ain't good at volleyball, you might be good at soccer. If you ain't good at soccer, you might be good at football. If you ain't good at none of them, you could be a coach. I mean. <laughs> or just be a fan and watch good it on point. TV. That too. Uh, or play how, chess. <laughs> how, might be there how is chess. your weekly <laughs> training routine? How is my training routine? Yeah. Um, so I work a full-time job from 8 to 4. Mm -hmm. um, so I have trained at 4.20 in the afternoon. It's probably about maybe two and a half hours. It's really rigorous. It's is hard. Is that every day? Um, yeah. Well, Monday to Thursday for right now. And once we um, start to pick up, um, mm -hmm. we're going to include Friday and Saturday. So basically one day of rest. My phone is on silent that whole day. Because um, like I say, you, it's, a, it's a lot of training in, in terms of preparing for triple jump is very technical mm -hmm. like you could have a good day on your half phase step might be off landing is good but because one phase is just off that impact your whole um your whole distance and so we put a lot of work into jumps um especially and so <sighs> i would say come to jumps the field events but just know it's a lot of work you have to put in to be um the best i would say yeah i hope everybody heard that yeah. She still has a full time job. Yeah. Still a world class athlete. No excuse. Trains just about every day out exactly. of the week. Exactly. So. But, anyways, I know you had a part of your training that you always highlighted with your, I guess, back leg when it comes to doing the triple jump. You mean the 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 position yeah like you said it was always like lagging behind or something um like, how did you correct that um well i i got to my coach kind of late um it's a long story from andres but i just started training with him maybe about three years now mm. and so he had to well i don't tell all the chainful secrets <laughs> on camera <laughs> <clears throat> but i can say he did a good job and um you know, speaking to me on the sidelines in training about where we want to go in terms of um, the technique. And so he would drill that into my head in training when we have um, jump sessions, um, especially in competition, you would definitely hear him. Everybody knows that. And so I pay attention to all the cues, um, um, especially going down the runway. Before I start my jump, I would envision like what I want to accomplish in terms of technique. And so once I know I hit that, 
um, I would get the distance um, because I focused on what I needed to focus on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Does any like aspect from your training or what you do kind of bleed into like your regular life? Like because you would have been let's just say changing your stands from takeoff and your hop step and everything. Mm -hmm. Has that changed anything from like how you walk up and down stairs, mm -hmm. how you sit down in a chair? Like I've seen some people like when they go through their training regimens, like just mm -hmm. the regular day things mm -hmm. like kind of change because mm -hmm. they're so mindful of every process that mm -hmm. they do. That's so funny you ask because just um I think yesterday or day before yesterday, I would do like certain movements, just walking my hands, like I'm emulating um going to, into my hop phase or just walking um upright. And so people would ask me, What are why, what are you doing? They would catch I'm not aware I'm doing certain stuff until people ask me and I think that's just some um, habit. But it's a good thing because you're practicing what you need to before you get to the um, competition or training. And so some things are just drilled into your head. And so not so much an overlay, but I do, I do know it teaches you discipline in terms of um, focus and training and then um, applying that to competition, even in sometimes work, because you have to be able to focus on the things that you're doing wrong in order to apply it to make it better and improve in at work too. So... It makes sense. All right. You said you're very competitive, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have a rival? Um, I wouldn't say rival, but we do I do have an up and coming um Charisma Taylor. Um she broke the indoor record. My previous indoor record, um, mm -hmm. I think it was this year. So she's definitely one of those, um, I would say You're keeping an eye on. Yeah, keep keep an eye on it, giving me a good push. And so um I'm glad that's happening because we we haven't had a ton or a lot um, of triple jumpers coming up. And so even long jumpers, I know a lot of you may know Antea Charlton, so she's doing long jumps. So I would say there's three of us now. And so I, I can say we have a good push, or I have a good push to um, to stay mm -hmm. mindful of that and to stay on top of things and come to training and competition. Yeah. Good question. I like the ask about your... Like the different levels of competition from high school, collegiate to professional. Mm -hmm. Like how what are the differences? How does it feel the same? Like Um, high school, you don't care. You're just happy you're doing mm -hmm, something. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, happy to be present, getting off the island. College. I feel college was believe it or not, college is more different than the professional ranks because you're on scholarship. Let me tell you, especially if you're from an international country, they expect you to score at the SEC conference, national conference. Otherwise, your scholarship is gone. That's pressure. Pressure was tall all my collegiate years. And so, so uh, if you were American, you wouldn't have to hit all those I don't marks. feel like they have that amount of pressure because why? We, we're traveling from <laughs> another country. Yeah, yeah. And so if they don't get the results that they want, they could possibly go to a different college right in the U.S. That's fair. Oh, that's fair. Maybe maintain the same um, scholarship um, offer in terms of the monetary amount that they're receiving. But we, on the other hand, if we, can, if we, if we get cut, who paying the difference? My mommy and daddy didn't have it. So I was like, miss, you got to get in the top eight in every conference, nationals, if you could. Nationals was a plus, but it mainly was a conference. And so that was pressure for me, but I pulled it okay. Um, and that teach me how to um, do well in pressure situations. And so, and then outside of that, in terms of training as a senior or elite athlete, professional athlete, I don't think it's as much pressure because either you're getting sponsored or you're not. You're living life. Um, you have to work. But if you want to do it, you have to make sure that it's something you want to do, you're passionate about, because it's a lot of work to maintain working and training. And so it's a balance. So it's just something you want to do after college. Yeah. All right. Right. You've been around, right? So what has been, well, two questions. What has been your favorite place to compete? Mm -hmm. Favorite competition? And do you have a... A favorite jump like a favorite the one jump you did and you was like okay this like it's stuck in your head as the jump for you um i would say my favorite place to compete what that i've competed would have been in london there are other beautiful places um in the caribbean probably second would be costa rica um i must say certain places they're a bit of a culture shock so um, that plays on you mentally, like going into competition, but at the track, it's completely different. And so it helps you to love home, 
even though it's in Nassau, it's in a real place sometimes. But yeah, um, as a bride, she protecting the country. Is I wanted to know <laughs> for now. I wanted to know just my um, hands up. <laughs> yeah, so def definitely London. I I can't remember the second part um, of the question. What was the jump for you? Um, and which comp? What which was your favorite competition? Um, I would think favorite how well favorite would be definitely competition wise in the arena of london but favorite for me would have been at the university of miami which would have been last year i had a and, and foul jumps don't count i know but that was probably my best jump the crowd was like crazy because we were trying to figure out at the board if if i got it or not if it was legal or not and so it killed me when it was like you were you're just a bit over and so i think it helped me to realize that I have the big jumps in me. I just have to get my approach under wraps and just nail it one time. And you'll see what happens from there. But definitely in the University of Miami last year. Yeah, so that was the that was the eye opener jump. That's like, yeah, I, I got yeah. this. I got the potential to top it. Yeah. So you mentioned that um your day to day life kind of you is something that you have to want to do. How mm -hmm. is like your nutrition mm -hmm. um in preparation for everything? Like, do you just get to eat like everybody else, or is oh, there like? No. Uh, so no, crap, sorry. Definitely not. Um, so um, from college, my my college coach he go always had a saying, "Um, fat don't fly," and I found it the hard way because imagine trying to get off the ground and you carrying all your all of your body weight, and so I have to get to a point where <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't look left or right or center. <laughs> just saying. Um, so I had to get to a point where I got to the appropriate weight for my height. As what as everybody should aim to do, um, health for health reasons. Um, so I'd get up protein shakes because I love those. I put on a lot of muscle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you just talking about I yeah. just listen. Um, I remember, but um, I eat fairly well. I do cheat. The, the, if I pick a cheat date, it has to be on a Saturday. Can't be Sunday because I trained on a Monday, and so. That wouldn't work. Um, so I have to remember to um, stay balanced with all my vegetables, my fruits, um, protein, carbs, um, any shakes that I may have. If I need a supplement, a meal, I'll do that. If I don't need to eat at night, like I say, is um, um, a smoothie is appropriate for me. Um, I love fruits, grapefruits specifically. I don't drink sodas. I don't drink at all. I don't smoke. And so I try to... Um, stay as lean as possible to, to help me fly in my jumps. And I feel it. I feel when I'm light and I feel when I'm heavy and I definitely don't want to be heavy when I'm jumping. And so I maintain my figure as best as, best as possible. So what do you cheat with? <clears throat> my coach is listening. Um, but I love cake, chocolate, um, and ice cream. Pulpies. Okay, that's fair. Sandy that's fair. Pot. Yeah. So I do cheat. I'm human. I mean, I have stuff once in a while but it's not like it doesn't make me feel bad because like, i don't have it all the time so when i do have it, yeah. it goes down. i mean and it's good because even with when it comes to like cravings for food mm -hmm. um when you give yourself a chance to have it like as a cheat versus mm -hmm. like continually starving yourself mm -hmm. you could have a little bit of it and mm -hmm. you'll be fine versus like it's like oh i really craving like the cake mm -hmm. and then you don't eat it then you mm -hmm. start craving it for like three weeks and mm -hmm. then your first slice is like half a cake yeah. versus like you get that, that one bite or a little sliver that first time and you're pretty much good to go so yeah. it's good uh, I, I wish i had your discipline when it comes to food <laughs> but it it's, it's not that. easy but this is why you're the professional athlete remember the meme with stewie and there's like you go in the bed all greek because you try to lose weight. <laughs> no, mm -mm. you have to make it make sense though. For yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Don't mm -hmm. kill yourself. Mm -hmm. So, being from the island and from the Bahamas in general, what do you think is some of like the biggest hurdles that you and other athletes kind of face uh, going into competition, especially international competition? And that's definitely one of the things I I, I had to speak about because I came from Anderson, so my path to um getting where I am now still isn't where I need to be because of my development from a young age. There are certain resources that we didn't have. Um, maybe um, in terms of coaching, maybe they lacked training. Or I wouldn't say lacked, didn't have access to training. And so that affected what I was taught um, essentially. And so I think we just need to you know, send more coaches from New Providence or Grand Bahama, whomever's willing to help to the island, have um, training camps. I know my coach um, does it for a few of the athletes in Andres, which is... I know beneficial for them because I wish I had that honestly growing up. I might have been further along um, in my journey now. And so we just have to be fair 
in how we you know, delegate like funds and um, resources and um, the coaches that have the specialty to coach um, jumps, sprints, hurdles, throws, um, and just be mindful of that because we have athletes all around the Bahamas. It's just not the Providence and Grand Bahama going at it all the time. We have athletes from around the you know archipelago of the, archipelago of the Bahamas, and so I just hope that they um, look into that a bit more, especially during this off-season training leading into um, the season. Yeah. What is the gateway? The gateway. Oh Lord. Jiminy? <laughs> oh man, that's a good 360, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Oh, what I want to ask is, like, how do you balance like work and training and non? Does your job like is comfortable and you need to take off the compete internationally, or like, how do you have that flexibility? Yeah, they're pretty understanding. Um, when it comes to um specifically, well. Um, if I'm selected to a team, I get the time off. Now, if I have to go to competitions, which I do have to go to, I have to take vacation because um, I guess it's the only it's – it's fair. I want to be fair in how they, I get treated to um, leave when I have to. And so I think, it's, I think it's fair treatment. It's hard working now and training and then traveling because some days I'd be the, I'd be the work and I'm, I feel like I'm not all the way there. And then I get to training and I'm like, I'm really tired today. I don't want to do anything. But I have to, like the mental toughness that it requires to train and um, work is a lot. And I think that's why a lot of athletes don't survive after college. It's, it, it's rough to be honest. So if you, that's why I say if you want to do this, you have to make sure it's something that you love and you can fund it as best as you can. Yeah. Okay, so back to the college thing. I have heard a lot of women athletes say that the coaches have come to them when they suffer injuries and say, you are worth two U.S. students. Is, that, is, is there any, like, you know, have you experienced this? Let me, let me make sure I get it clear before I answer. You, you're saying the U, U.S. students are worth more than... No, they say an international student uh -huh. worth two U.S. students. Oh, so they were more. Of, yeah, no, Us. that's part of the pressure. Mm. So, like, yeah. they're basically saying you taking up two spots yeah. for a U.S. student. So, is that there any validity to that? Yeah, I can, I can honestly say that because they would, they would tell you, say, hey, um, we bringing you in to... We went. We we literally had team meetings where we're going. We we're in it to win a national championship this year. We need everybody to play their part. You don't have to guess what part you need to play. That means you need to score because if you if you, they're paying your full scholarship. So your intention is to get into that final. Where it be eight and you get that one point, you get your point and you walk away happy, scot free with your scholarship. You can't expect to be there year after year. Um. Just holding space and you ain't helping the team. Is is this? What about the injury recovery process? Um. Okay. Injury. I think is uh it's up and down because you can um have a medical redshirt. Let's say in your freshman year, and take that whole time to heal. And hopefully that next year you can show some kind of improvement in terms of your mark and what they actually brought you there for. And let's say your junior year, things don't seem to. Um, translating what they wanted and so it, it can be tough injuries can make or break you and so it just requires a lot of focus in terms of getting back um recovery wise to where you need to be to maintain your your scholarship so that could be a a tough one to answer yeah yeah because to, to the injury point i've had a few people that i know personally talk about um they wanted to go into certain sports mm -hmm. and when they found out like getting covered under the school's insurance was a bit hard to do because they were international mm -hmm. and because of that they had to like drop out because if they had a severe injury mm -hmm. they would have to come out of their pocket mm -hmm. first because the university would only be able to cover up to a certain amount mm -hmm. like it's something like that uh you had to go through or other people on the track and field team had to go through as well um not necessarily me I I think um, where it comes, where it gets tricky with that is if you're a walk-on to the track and field team, um, you're not, not, not necessarily um, covered. You may be covered with certain stuff in terms of receiving uniform or meals or per diem for team travel. But if you're not like on a full scholarship, you're not fully covered under everything. And so I think that's one of the things at least have to be mindful of and careful of. If you're choosing a university, ask what's included 
so that you know what in a, in advance if you get injured okay they're going to cover me versus if i could if i have to cover myself because i'm walking on to team i'm asking them to take me um to compete or perform so just have to be mindful of yeah of okay. that mm-hmm. so on the national team are you, do they insure you do they have certain benefits as well <laughs> You see where I lean in. You see where I lean in. <laughs> okay, let me just be careful. I mean, how I... In all fairness, he said you were coming to bring down to break down the establishment. So I just asked yeah, a question, bro. I just asked a question. It's almost break down <laughs> the establishment time. Like I feel like for Team Bahamas, like if you get injured, um, there are doctors on staff to help you. But like once you get home, I don't honest, I don't necessarily feel like they check for you that much. Like. You're pretty much, I feel, on your own. Um, I would really, I, a perfect example would probably be like um, Levan Sands when he got injured, because um, he told me he told me about it um, when he was trying to recover. He he didn't hear from a lot of people in terms of um, how he's doing or helping with medical bills and um, et cetera. And so, I am concerned. I'm always concerned when I go on the national team to be mindful of not getting injured because I don't know who's going to have my back if something happens. And so <laughs> I'm just being honest. So you're telling um, me now that Steven Gardner. Well, oh boy. I mean, it, nah, with Stevie, I know he has a good um, support team. So in that way, he should be he should be fine in terms of the support he receives medical-wise. Now, okay. I don't know what the Bahamas is going to do on their end, but his, I'm sure his agent and his management team is going to ensure yeah. that one oh, of yeah. their top athletes yeah. recovers and gets back to tip-top shape. The Bahamas, however, I don't know. So how does that work when you all compete um, in the you know, professional circuit like the Diamond League and these other meets mm-hmm. versus competing national league with Team Bahamas? Like, so would you be on your mm-hmm. own insurance when you could be solely? That's or? a great question. Hey. You guys coming in hot. Okay. Um, so <laughs> on the Diamond Lead um, circus, we're definitely not under the national umbrella. And so that pretty much, you you pretty much have to cover your your medical um, bills, injuries, um, doctor visits, therapy, recovery by yourself. Now on the team Bahamas, you're supposed to have, you're supposed to have coverage. Because like I say, if I go to university, I'm competing for them. They're going to cover me if something happens to me, if I need to get surgery, recovery, um, whatever I need to get back to the form I was in before I got injured. So in the same token, Team Bahamas has to take that same approach with their athletes because if athletes don't trust that if something happens to them while they're on a team, what guarantee do you have for them that they're going to travel? There has to be something set in stone where they feel comfortable, where they feel trusting that... If something happens to me, I'm going to get covered. I don't feel that's happened in for a number of years. They may, I may be wrong. A Karen may come under the comments and tell, well, this situation happened that you may not be aware of. Let me know because I haven't heard of anything in a while. So I just feel that there needs to be clarity so that everybody knows. If, there, if it's in writing, present it so that everybody can see it because a lot of things going on now is just mind-boggling. Yeah. You said you said a lot of things. What issues do you feel need to be addressed? Well, mm. um, I have a few things. <laughs> um, like I said, um, I, I mentioned the book. <laughs> one or two things. One of um, some athletes came to me because um, I feel like if you speak up, sometimes people tend to. I wouldn't say hate you, but they look at you a certain way. Yeah, like, yeah. where is she getting this information from? <clears throat> How dare she say this out loud? But anyway, um, number one is definitely the communication between, like, the federation and um, the athletes and coaches and the federation. I feel like um, a lot of things that come out, we aren't aware of what's going on. Now, I, I, I do know that there's a senior athletes WhatsApp group um, that a lot of athletes are in. And for those watching, if you don't know about it, there is one. You can contact me and I'll let you know how to um, be a part of it. However, I prefer not to be in the WhatsApp group for reasons of my own. And I relay this message to someone in the executive team in 
June, I want to say, before traveling to El Salvador. But apparently, another person, another member of the executive team felt that um, he didn't understand why I, did, I was not a part of that um, WhatsApp group. And, I, and I, I mentioned, I said, you know, there are other alternatives to communicating to athletes. Um, some prefer to be in that group. Some don't. Try to find ways to allow athletes to feel included without um, approaching them or making them feel like their decision doesn't make sense or um, they aren't right. We are senior athletes. We have a voice, and it's our opinion. Respect it. Um, he, I was approached at training about this situation that created a whole situation that escalated or did not have to escalate. Some people didn't even know I could go to zero to 100 real fast, but it depends on how you approach a person. If you approach them with respect, you get respect back, and that did not happen that day. Um, I forgive, but I don't forget, and so stuff that I create trust issues, and so that needs to change. Respect the person's opinion and decision, and just move forward. You know, I spoke, like I said, I mentioned this to another exec before, and she understood, and I was happy with that. For, for that, for him to come back around now and address it again, I didn't understand that, but just find ways to find make people included and just move on, I guess. Ladies and gentlemen, as we've seen multiple times before, communication is definitely key. And I think that's something that the Bahamas in general needs to work on um, yeah. across the board, like <laughs> even if it's just notices that go out. Because I think we as a country have... Um, a way of kind of pigeonholing ourselves into communicating in one form, even as simple as um, just putting notices in the paper when let's just say probably only 25% of the population reads yeah. the newspaper. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that they shouldn't read it, but it's like we have to find more ways to communicate with people. Um, but back to some of the concerns, like is there any other concerns that you, you've yeah, seen? Yeah, I actually had? have like. Yeah, this is going to be serious. For yeah, you. yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, so we will now turn over the segment to questions, comments, queries, and concerns. Yes. So next, um, this might be a problematic one, but training in terms of what we're allowed to train in um, while at the track. <sighs> I gotta watch me work. Interesting. So apparently, like when when we're at the track, um, everybody knows it's the norm for for female athletes to train in a sports bra and tights. Um, for men to typically they would take their top off and train in their tights. That's the norm in the track and field community. But apparently here in the Bahamas, we can't do that. The minute you take off your top, put your blouse on, put your top on. I could understand. This is probably the, a defense on both sides. And let me just say, I could understand both sides, but from an athlete's perspective, if you're trying to get cool, if you're trying to, you know, get through a workout, the automatic response is for you to raise your shirt or to take it off to get cool. It's, it's pointless if you're allowing female athletes in competition to compete in a sports bra and tights or a sports bra and buns. Does anybody know what buns is? It looks like underwear. It's pretty much a... Oh. Well, I don't. You guys are showing your buns. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. What that too? I need to start going to the church. So, <laughs> Justin, why is the problem? Ju He's the reason why the rules. Just Justin against my argument. <laughs> but um, yeah, you have junior athletes competing in buns and and Tyson. So you have to make it make sense. You can't tell us we can train, we can compete in this, and we can't train the same way. Something has to change about that. I understand that senior athletes and junior athletes have to train together. And that's another issue I think we need to work on. Maybe finding different ways for them to train separate. But if that can't happen, what what is gonna be what what has to be done for that to change? Like you can't expect us to, like I say, compete in w one way, but we have to train a different way. I don't understand why that that rule came in. Who made the decision? But that has to change. Like you, if you're in a, in a competition, wherever you are, there are gonna be kids in the in the in the stand. Exactly. There's gonna be juniors in the stand watching these people competing the same things you say we can't train in. They're gonna see it. They're gonna grow up anyway to possibly doing the same thing because it's the nature of the sport. It's it's just how we do things. So please reconsider. Like just huh? removing it. <laughs> I thought you talk about headbands. <laughs> Definitely not. No, no. 
They have that rule because we trying to be like a town in the Middle East. And but we ain't. We you train like a tropical <laughs> country. Like it's impossible. So you want people to have one? Uh, the well, full you thing? Know, you know how we get selective conservatism inside? Yeah, it's like, I believe they're like 50 or 60 or something. How do we yeah. change it? Imply that. Or how do we start to change it? Um, I just, I think um, one of the athletes, um, made a good suggestion i think um we should have a training facility just aimed towards maybe senior athletes um elite athletes professionals in terms mm-hmm. of how we train how we allow to train because i don't it? yeah say again who's building it that's a good question um <laughs> they actually were speaking about <laughs> having a sports academy for years now i don't know when it's actually going to happen but i pray it happens soon um because in cuba literally um they're, they have a, a facility right across from the track. You could walk there. The athletes from d- different disciplines, boxing, swimming, track and field, um, you name it, they're in that area and they're able to do what they have to do um, to be successful. And we haven't had that yet. And I feel like we have the to do it. That's what the National Stadium was supposed to be. But then they put all them different government agencies inside. Yeah. See that? And, yeah, and that's Ronaldo. The, they get and run out of there now too. And I think that's the problem. Like if they if they like focus on what's important, everybody can be happy. But like you can't just hand down a ruling, oh, you can't take your shirt off. What? All in college. You come you've been you in college should come home to like a... Yeah, backwards. You take it you take it you take two years. Yeah, that's not, that's not fair. Like that needs to change. I, or find a way for everybody to be happy, but I don't see the point in it. I'm Hold on, men just be telling you this, or women just be enforcing this law? There's a certain individual that's in the executive team that specifically, if you, if he, if, if they're present at the track of the day, they would tell you to put your your top on. I think he probably had something to do with implementing it. And, I, and if he's listening, I just want him to reconsider it because at some point, if he, I don't know if he was an athlete, but if you have. People that you treat that that you know are athletes, please just try to understand why it is we've been doing it all of these years, and then for that to just happen when you came in power, I I don't understand it. Yeah, it's like it's like re- recently new because when the executive team changed, that came out of nowhere. Like it wasn't on any signage. One day we just came with the draw, tops were off. Put your tops on. What? <laughs> <laughs> wow like uh, i don't understand it's not fair that's why i say communication mm-hmm. is lacking when it comes to those at the top versus the athletes and we're, we're the ones training we're the ones doing the hard work to try to represent the country please try to understand the frustration in understanding why that was yeah, implemented because like, yeah, like, it sounds like is you want you want to be able to train like you play exactly. and now the rule has changed but you don't have any like you you weren't given any kind of communication as to why the changes happened no. it's just like all of a sudden mm. things would have shifted mm. so it goes back to our point like Bahamas, we, we gotta we gotta talk man you gotta learn how to communicate but that's 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 interesting yeah you know people only know one way how to do things sometimes and they go that way their entire lives and then i think the real thing is now that don't let somebody who young now, don't let him pass it on to them and it be something where <laughs> it's like an eternal law. that's what law. I'm saying. Like those young athletes, they are essentially like competing in, I don't even wear buttons some of the time, but you have someone younger than me wearing it, but you don't want me to feel comfortable in my sports bra. Like I know, I understand they're trying to probably say maybe it's giving a wrong idea to the junior athletes. I could understand that, but try to understand when they get older, I guarantee you at one point, they're going to be doing the same thing we've been doing this for years, training that way in Nassau, probably around Addis, around the world. They're still doing it now. Why are we, why do we have to suffer for a decision that, to, to be honest, does not make sense? It does not. I'm sorry to say it that way, but yeah. Okay, so next up on the agenda. <laughs> Like, when it comes to team selection, and I think the notification period in which an athlete is notified, that has to improve. So, okay, coming from last year, we had, uh, I think it was the NACAC championships in Grand Bahama. And um, after trials, we weren't 
one or two weeks after trials, we weren't notified about who made the team, when the team was traveling. Literally one to two weeks before the team traveled, we were being notified. I have a problem with that. Why? Because this is a summer meet. Athletes tend to shut down their season based on if they know they're going to be named to a team or they continue training to ensure that they're in competitive um, shape to compete. If you don't tell anybody what's going on, what do you think is going to happen? Their performance might be hindered because they took off a month, couple weeks. I took off like two weeks, three weeks. That's time I could have used to like stay in shape. And everybody was talking about it, but no one said anything because when you speak up, sometimes you tend to get you tend to get grilled or in problems for speaking your mind. But it's the truth. You can't notify an athlete one or two weeks in advance. They don't, don't have no preparation time. We have to inform our um, our jobs that we need time off. We have to make arrangements. I don't know. Some some athletes have kids, so we need to make sure we just inform everybody in a timely model. Um, when it comes to certain teams that aren't governed by our federation, by the B3As, such as CAC, Commonwealth Games, Pan Am Games, that's governed by the Bahamas Olympic um, Committee. And so... The criteria for selecting athletes is not clear. Um, we are aware that there is a long list that athletes can um, sign up for if they're interested in um, competing. But when it comes down to like a couple of days or maybe a month to select the team members, how are you selecting the persons that are traveling? We need to make it fair and we don't need to make it seem like um, this certain individual is constantly going when there are other individuals that are just as capable, just as competitive, um, um, disciplined to go. We need to make it fair so that there's no problem straight across the board from the athletes, the coaches, to the management team, and that's not being done. It's, and it's been going on for a while. Pan Am Games is coming up in October. Um, so I, I want to see exactly what is the criteria you're going to use for persons who are going to compete, because I guarantee you a lot of the athletes are I shut down their, their season after July, August, and starting our season training. What is the criteria for who is going to be selected? And please make it fair. That's, that's is all there I'm any saying. explanation as to why no. that's the case? That's the explanation right there. <laughs> that's the explanation right there. You the That's the two weeks' notice right there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I guess one of y'all can ask question. I don't know. Oh no, you had the same question. Well, oh, you said you said that's the answer. The B3As and how the Olympic Committee are. Um, well, the B3As is, is solely responsible for the track and field um, team or athletes. And the BOC or the Bahamas Olympic Committee, they govern um, like multi-game um, competitions. And so... Whereas um, multiple sports go, like the, the sporting games we had in um, El Salvador, tennis, beach soccer, volleyball, basketball, softball, track and field, swimming, they govern that overall umbrella. And so that's the major difference. They pick the, they pick the, the, the athletes for those teams, but the beach race can recommend who they want to go. But ultimately it's up to the, I think the BOC to decide which um, athletes travel, yeah. So there's no automatic qualifying. No, and see that. I could say if you had standards, okay, maybe that's the first thing. If you have standards, if you hit the standard, you're in the running to go. Um, what else? Maybe that's an, that's like an obvious one. If you have a standard, yeah. you hit the standard, you, hit the you the go. Qualifying standard, you were like right. in the pool to go. Right. Versus like. Uh, Correct. Like if you know, <laughs> should I say it? Yeah. So if you have the standards, like in advance. At least know if y'all don't get this, you don't go. That's fair. But you, if you just picking from people competing and at least constantly training like year round just to represent the country and they don't go when they had the opportunity to go, it 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 does something to their comfort. That like they are, I don't I, I don't so know. So was there ever a time when y'all felt like somebody went who y'all necessarily feel shouldn't have gone? Sure. This one. Yeah, it on. <laughs> um, don't call no names. No, no we don't. No, I, I call no names. I call no names. But I mean, there has been like situation. That's why I mentioned. Um, you have to 
present like a fair selection criteria because if someone goes on a team that hasn't competed in season at all mm. but they on the team how did they get on the team when someone who has been producing traveling from um around the u.s or traveling from nassau to the u.s to compete to show you all they're in comparative shape how are other persons getting on the team that did nothing that show you nothing that showed no results that's what I meant by there has to be a fair way in how people are being selected to teams. That's all I want. Man, they saying, That's they all saying, everybody they wants. They saying the visa, the visa wasn't up, the visa wasn't current, man. Like, like I said, but it all goes about the communication because, yeah. I mean, as athletes, y'all don't know. Like, you're saying that, that you don't know or you're not aware of the standard exactly. So, mm-hmm. like, again, man, we just... We need to know. The athletes need yeah, to know. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. me as a regular <clears throat> behemoth don't know what, like the qualifying mm-hmm. standards or anything is. I mm-hmm. think the people who are involved, like you yeah. athletes, like the ones who are direct, directly impacted, should have some form of guidelines to be able to see like, hey, this is why it's happening and be open to having a conversation. And mm-hmm. I think I think that's what it sounds like the main thing is. Like mm-hmm. just meeting with the executive team, upper management. It just ah. Yeah. <sighs> My head hurt. Um, <laughs> but we ain't done yet. We only caught our way through, bro. Um, <laughs> so um, we travel to um, El Salvador and Chuan. And usually when you travel on a national team and you're selected, you're given per diem. Um, and per diem mm. acts as like an emergency fund in the event that you need to buy food. Um, in case the food that is being offered or served in the country Maybe your stomach isn't accustomed to it. You're allergic to something. You, you get to go out and buy food or help with baggage or et cetera, et cetera. When we got to the airport, um, we're looking around. Okay, so waiting for our bags to get paid. No, nope, there's no funds for bags. Okay, we covered our bags thinking we're going to get in reimbursed when we get there. Nope, there's no per diem. And so me being one of the senior athletes on... On the team, I'm just curious on um, why is there not per diem for um, the CAC Games team? There never was. Well, when was that communicated? Don't you think that's something important to mention to athletes being selected, traveling to a different country? You don't know if these athletes have money? I mean, I mean, no, but a lot of um, the, the majority, the other national teams that I've been on receive per diem. And that's the right thing to do. You're supposed to receive it. Imagine now, more like, I've mm-hmm. heard stories with other sports disciplines, mm-hmm. and the same thing happens. Really? Yeah. So just like a widespread. I which heard is, this in just like a country thing. Which, <laughs> is, is which is so wrong. And I hope for the number one reason that they like to give, oh, there was too many people traveling. That is not the right thing to say. That's no, very just give, unprofessional. Just give them your gifts. Just give your last. If that's the case. It's n- that too. It's not appropriate. Mind you, there's one coach right now that's a- actively working to get our reimbursement, but this happened from June. Nobody's saying nothing. Like, we're just supposed to, like, slip it under the rug, cover the rug, stand on it, and don't say nothing. C- come on, man. We need to be more f- professional. Like, give if, you, if you're not going to pay it for whatever reasons, because I'm sure funding is allocated for every team traveling. You know the team is traveling. Allocate the funds for each each team, whether it be beach soccer, swimming, track, who only had seven athletes, by the way. Um, and no jump, that's another, I'm going to get to that eventually. There was no jump coach that went to, with that team. But let's deal with the, the problem at hand. No, ba- no reimbursements for our baggage. No per diem. If we get to the airport and we have no money, well, how are we getting to the meet? Because I can't pay for my bike. If the, if the next Ali Basabi don't have enough to cover me and them, well, how am I getting there? That's going to be a whole scene. Then when it comes out, well, the, the Ali didn't have money. Why y'all didn't have money? Did you give me money to cover my bike? <laughs> exactly. No, so all of that is going to trickle down, and then no one's going to take blame for why the athletes did not receive what they were supposed to receive. Every university team I went on, I received per diem. When you're selected to, um, you know, represent... A team or a country, you're that it that's allocated for a reason, and let's not devi- deviate away from it. The funds being allocated, please ensure that the athletes are getting it. So something like that, right? What I'm assuming sponsorships mm-hmm. are sought out. Mm-hmm. So, do they ever give an explanation as to why that's the case? 
If there is, we won't receive it. We won't know. They won't tell us anything. And that's my, that's my issue when it comes to communication. Like, I'm sure they're aware these teams are traveling. Let's say they, they are allocated funds, but they don't have the money. Well, like, seek out sponsorship. Like, like he's saying, get the approvals from whoever you need to ensure that these athletes are fully equipped to travel because anything can happen going from one country to the next. And I've witnessed some things that require emergency funds and that you can't just send an athlete like blindsided without any backup, especially money. And that's, and that's important. It's not always about money, but definitely when you go into a different country, you need it. You can't show up. We, we showed up there expecting to receive it and there was none. I, it's not, I don't blame the person, the, the chef that was there. I, I totally put blame on the um, governing body responsible for that team. And maybe they're not to blame, but someone is. And I just want an explanation as to why the artists didn't receive it. In every sport, discipline that travel to El Salvador. So are you all going to travel again without even receiving it prior to leaving? Boy, I know, I know one thing. One or two of them say they're scared that they, they even say they're being selected because you could imagine going to like an especially Spanish-speaking country. Yeah, I know to say dinero, but like, <laughs> how to say? I, no, I, 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 I can't, I can't understand. Like, 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 like you're saying the the next team coming up is Pan Am. For all athletes that's, that's watching this, is possibly going to be selected. One of your major questions better be: Are we receiving per diem? That's the first and major thing. And so, if if they're not, you need to question them as to why you're not receiving it. Can't get heat for this. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious. What the? It is. Yeah, and that's how I thought about it. It's like this story, as Justin said, like we had this across, across. like is across multiple disciplines or like. But the, like we said, we need to talk about it. Like, is it? I don't even know. Like, and I know we won't participate in everything, and I think that's part of the issue too. Like, not necessarily a whole year off. Why don't we just take some events off, some competitions off, and like just plan. Like just plan properly for plan. the next year. You think they can save plan. the right. money up though? The money ain't getting saved regardless. What I'm saying, <laughs> it make sense. What I'm saying is, like, if you take some meets off to properly plan ahead for other ones, mm. so at least like when these things happen, and they're just like, oh well, we have this going on and this going on. So let's just say for Pan Am Games, you send in a track team, a basketball team, a swimming team, and a volleyball team, and he's like, oh shoot, like we got all this coming up, blah blah blah, blah. and it takes a while. Yeah. And then, so what if you just don't do the meet in July and you just prepare to send everybody to Pan Am Games or something like that? Like, I, it, it rough, man, man. And know. see, that's a good point because they know way in advance when the, these, these, meets, when are these meets are. You t- you're trying to tell me you don't have eight months preparation time to, like, sort these um these issues out? We I just know in the Bahamas, like, we true to the saying, we wait last minute to do everything. And it shows. And that puts pressure on the athlete now. To try to focus on these other stuff that's going on and trying to compete. You can't be doing that. Think of the athlete first, which makes them comfortable, but which allows them to perform at their best. And not having to worry about how they're paying for their buys, how they're paying for their poles, their javelins. Like, you only help them with nothing? You all expect me to do all this on my own, but you all select me to go. Big balling, <sighs> Say what? Big balling. If they, like, like, literally, with the, with the um, bodybuilding veterans. Oh, that's a, ooh. So, I mean, I'm no, I know one of my um, do my coworkers, like he working it, and he end up paying for his whole hotel. Yeah, <laughs> they don't, they don't get no. They have to pay for his whole hotel, getting sprayed on, and then obviously you ain't getting compensated for it. You ain't getting mm-hmm. compensated, and as soon and as soon as you do something, and I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, Posted mm. out the advertise, hey, Bayman does this, that, and the third yeah, for team, yeah, for team Bahamas, but mm. like literally self funded. What about a walk off? I mean, I know, I know you ain't gonna do it because Bahamian's petty, mm. right? So a whole no, but I'm yeah, saying no. Wait, as one, that's one person. That, I'm talking though. about, I'm talking about a whole team. A whole team gets selected. No one, mean, no one the whole team ain't gonna be it, man, see, bro. Yeah, it's tricky with that because like there are two angles on it. Everybody have to agree not to go. Yeah. But let's say you never traveled in a couple of years and you won't make a team in a while. You, you fight in between, do I really want to work with them? Or do I really want to go, get this medal, 
even though there's no no money, sometimes it's not always about the money. It's just about the recognition. And so that's tough. But sometimes you have to take a snatch because if you don't, they can keep doing the same thing. And then if you don't go, some people are um, receiving government subvention. So you would always say a sip sip or I don't know what true it is. That's why I'm saying it's not factual. Oh, if you're if you're on a subvention, you have to go. You have to be on the relay. You have to compete. So it's like you're only you're almost being threatened to like you have you have no choice. You have to go. But forget all of that. Money, they say money never laid on income with, with God of you for you. Sometimes you just have to take a stance, I feel. And we at that point in the Bahamas where that have to be done because if things don't change, I don't know how well our sporting world in the Bahamas is going to last. If we keep allowing people to just think laziness, procrastinating, is going to get us anywhere. Do you think mm. it, it, it that was sporting the thing is how to is prioritized? Say again? You think that a lot of the sporting disciplines with this funding, because there's always been a funding issue that mm-hmm. for the last, for decades, it's been a funding issue. I remember my aunt used to compete on the national softball team and mm-hmm. used to have share uniform with the men's. Oh, that's another so, one you talk what? about. Yeah. Yes, bro. That's another one you talk about. Seven years ago. That's dark. <laughs> yeah, so it's like the funding issue properly for athletes. Oh, yeah. Really that was what the share uniforms do. <laughs> oh, no. So you think it how for these teams had some like privatization to it? You mm-hmm. think it would probably be better with the fun? Um, is that even possible? It 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 is possible, you know, but um, Prince, right? Like Prince mentioned, it requires planning, and so we already know that there are there are a lot of teams traveling or different sporting disciplines. And so depending on the number of athletes, you have to plan wise in terms of how you're going to fund them. But it just it just requires a, um, seeking sponsorships early, going to the right person, specifically persons that are interested in the betterment of that sport or in athletes in general. Um, because obviously I think one of the two top um, sports that probably would maybe get it easily would usually be track and field and swimming, which I don't think is always fair because you have athletes that can excel, excel in other um, disciplines. But when it comes to those multi-game teams and then uniform and then um, funding, it's a struggle because when we went to El Salvador, I'm going to be real, some of the beach soccer guys, they didn't have like sufficient clothing. I felt really bad for them. Even one or two of the track and field athletes that traveled from the U.S., Usually, if you travel from the U.S. and not from home, they will send uniform um, for the athletes to compete. And some of the buys were like, they didn't have enough, but they have what they needed to compete in. So I thank the person who, who tried to pack it as best as they can. I don't always um, throw blame at all, but they try their best. But I think it's important. That's why I always try to advise younger athletes and senior athletes. If you're traveling, if you've been on a team before, don't trade your uniform. Don't yes they do. Oh, I can get you for that. They can say whose side you on. They can say tomorrow whose side you on. I'm just being honest. <laughs> <laughs> but you, would you trade in the uniform? It's a jersey to swapping. get a, a Trinidad uniform, it's a jersey swap. Jamaica, uh, like you know the the competition. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that oh. when you get in the senior range, you're gonna see why is it no no even juniors, because if you know there's gonna be a shortage of uniforms, guess what? You had the uniform they gave you, but you traded it. But and could have had it. This is what I'm saying. This is not the NFL. You say it both as a No, but that, that might be. That, that might be. be. Yeah, okay, yeah, it depends on the situation. It ain't a bunch of hymns and hers for me to be. Like, if you were the Olympics, if you were the Olympics, right? You wouldn't do it at the Olympics? Come on now. Is the mind better than the now? If it's you saying both at his peak, is it better than that if he did it before? Yeah, but if it's him at his peak, you probably get it anyway. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. So, what was the point? That's what he said. Because you have some form of power from <laughs> I, yeah, I, I know what I mean. Mike, do us all swap Super Bowl jerseys. They, they swap regular season jerseys, dog. But the boy already established, though. Sure. <laughs> well, I no jerseys. See, but the thing is, right? I swap in, jer- I swap in jerseys under the impression that I'm getting another one. So I understand. That, that is that is that is so, what happens. Yeah. So if I so yeah, I do it. I do it thinking I get it. But if if you mean to tell me that hey, I um, 
you don't have I'm not giving you one and I have to like go dig up what it is I mean you may see me in a Trinidadian <laughs> game <laughs> game <laughs> game <laughs> over that's what, that's what they're thinking on both sides one side's thinking I can make another team they giving me more uniform the other side's thinking they been on the team they don't need no more uniform or we can give them just sufficient yeah. To last, and that's so that's what's going on. Wow. So you, you just have to be careful how you oh, play things. Make one nah, no, <laughs> no way. Why? Because you have a sponsor that you have to. No, I can put the sponsor. The bad, no, the no, bad, no, 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 no. That no, could be a that real I, thing. No, I mean, no, like no. it ain't the same. You have to go through. You have to go through it. Like even yeah. some of like some of the fly football teams. Like once you get a sponsor, the uniforms yeah. have to be made and paid for through that and same you have process. To wear that, yeah, you can't just get. I'm, you know, yeah. like the polo, they have the horse, and then yeah. there's like, the horse cousin. I don't know. That's USP something. You know no, yeah, it has to be the yeah. You have to be the actual sponsor on wearing and competing and walking in the village because mm-hmm. yeah, situations happened in the past where someone got caught wearing a different, and so we end up having to change, um, you know, sponsors. If I'm getting it correct. No, the sponsor put up because you're on Pretty much. No, you know. I thought, I thought when you said that, I was thinking that they have to share uniforms. Like um, that actually happens though. If you, you don't have it, me, I'm and I can. Oh, oh no, no way, no way. I, I not wear someone else's speedo. I guess <laughs> this is where we know. <laughs> That'd be really weird. That'd be really weird. But we have, we have, like even San Salvador, like some of the high jumpers had to, you know, ask to borrow. Um, competition to stop tops to train. I mean to compete in, and so there's sometimes the shortages based on the number of teams traveling, and then. <laughs> so be mindful of that. He's the first in line. So yeah. Do the sponsors cover? Do they have like a limit? Um, you mean uniforms? for the teams or the? The uniforms. The uniforms. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think there's a. <laughs> there's always a joke that they're hiding uniforms because there's never any that we receive. But I. I can't. I can't <laughs> verify that. It's all a joke. Um, <laughs> like, but you will. You will see other people that never made a team wearing uniforms. How you get that? Well, how you get that? They were the first on the line. Yeah. So just interesting. I don't know if they get it from people that made teams or persons that have access to the uniforms, but. Sometimes it gives you a weird feeling that that's something I was looking for, but this person have it on. <laughs> that's all I go say. Wow. Um, yeah, so if you're an athlete, keep your uniform. <laughs> you don't get stuck in another country, you can have no clothes. But anyway, yeah. That's all I have to say on that one. Sure. What's next on the list? Um, okay, in terms of sponsorships, um, it doesn't always have to be monetary, um, but it, it definitely helps in terms of for senior athletes, I guess, traveling to meet, if you want to offer a certain amount, whether it be $50, $100, whatever you can afford, because the reality mm-hmm. is everybody still has to survive. It has a business here. And so we want to be fair um, in how we, we ask for stuff. And so if there are people that are listening that can't contribute to athletes training home, because it gets expensive when you have to travel. That's another point I'm going to make after this. When you have to travel to meet to um, ensure you get recognized for your marks or to qualify for me you have to travel and so it gets pretty expensive and i feel like um in terms of that um it can be a maybe a donation of water a case of water powerade gatorade um any terms of a, a reduction in services such as um massage wait, massages or um chiral visits um and so there are a number of persons that help with that that i have to mention because you could imagine trying to, if you're an athlete living alone, <coughs> me, paying rent, bills, grocery, gas, maintaining your car, insurance, um, all those other stuff in addition to paying monthly. For each physio session, you, you got to go once a like, week. Like, that's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> Massages. <laughs> it's a lot. It is. A, so, uh, it, because it comes to a point in time where you have to decide what's more important. Are you getting this massage? Because if I don't get a massage today, I can feel this next week. That means I possibly um, injuring my hamstring, my quads. I out anyway if I don't get this massage or I'm, I'm not going to pay this bill right now and my light going to be... Is my light going to be off if I don't pay it? Like, you I are... One solar generator, <laughs> For true, but you, you understand if you don't have it, right? So you have to make, like, 
decisions. And so we just need help in whatever possible way. And so I was going to mention Henry Butler, um, a tab, um, Nicholas Molly, he's a massage therapist, and um, Jonathan Higgs, also a massage therapist, and um, Dwight Marshall, he is a chiropractor. They definitely try to help in as many ways as possible to offer um, a reduction of what they charge us, and so I'm really appreciative of that. And so if more people like that can come forward, I think we, it will make training home a bit easier because it's very expensive, like the bishops say, to live in Nassau, just being honest. So, yeah, it just helps. Yeah, but for those that receive government subvention, it's different from those that don't. And even receiving that, you still have to pay coaching fees, your massages, try to get your water, get your meals, travel with that money. So imagine there's nothing left when it's time to pay for airfare, hotel accommodation, or even an Uber, if you prefer Uber or Lyft. So, big ball, big ball, no, you're not a small baller because you're. <laughs> 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 nice, when you, so you gotta be big baller so you get, you know, travel back. Yeah, so, they, so they say you need a hotel accommodation, you be like, yeah. Just people, it's, like it's a lot because you're trying to get to meet to improve your marks to get more money. But if you can't get to meet to improve your marks, you're possibly gonna be taking up subvention <laughs> because you're not performing. Or you're gonna get a, um, an increase in what you receive, and so it's pressure sometimes. But that's why I say a lot of athletes don't make it because it's just easier to focus on your personal life and enjoying life than trying to balance Sounds two very things hectic. at yeah two things at once. So what's next? Um, okay, yeah. So like I mentioned before, in terms of the sponsorships, when it comes to um, and the reason being for that. After about Carifta trials, probably gonna get heat for this too. But after Carifta trials, I feel the only thing we care about is Carifta games. And you see, after March, April, there are hardly any meets. The majority of the meets be from January to March. After that, you're you're on your own, like Pat Bone, like Grammy, and say you have to travel, and that's like between maybe March, April. To July or June, um, leading up to trials, and I cannot um, emphasize how expensive it is to travel to certain places. And um, personally, for me, right now, I only go to meets that improve my ranking, and, be, and they just implement this too. So you get points based on um, the level of meet it is. Maybe it's A, B, or C, gold, silver, bronze. Um, your placement and then your mark is a is a whole. It's the whole thing. So you get points based on that, and it, it overall improves your your rate, your um, ranking in the in the world. And so that's like a plan B if you can't achieve the standard outright. And so it's hard to get to those meets because it's always either in the U.S. or um in Europe. And it's not like I could drive so to state to state. It's it's a fight, it's a struggle. And so I wish we had more meets here, or maybe um. In terms of being, um, I know we have the, the NACA president is from here, so he's been trying to help us a lot with um, getting Michelle to help us with that. Even up to this year, we had one in um, Crown Bahama, so that was a big help. Or sometimes I, I would go to Dominican Republic or um, um, right here in um, Florida, depending on, or Chula Vista. And so, and that's in California, I think it is. So it's very mm, expensive, and yeah. so... I just wish they put more emphasis on caring more for the athletes that train home because that's why nobody uh, likes to be here. I'm going to be honest. Nobody likes to be home because of either how you're being treated from leadership yeah. or there are no meets. So what's the point being here anyway? So they just if you're base not themselves any wherever the meets are. Yeah. And so they base themselves where they can get to meets, which is smart if you can afford it. Yeah. If you don't have maybe a family, if you don't have any ties or any. Or if you just like, you're yeah. a big baller. Yeah, if, big, if you big just, baller, like big Jackson baller. said. You know, so you, you know have to have the money. So you can say, wait. I work in for more months. Yeah. Six weeks off during a year. Yeah. And I get paid for my own accommodation. There are not a lot of athletes training more. Mm-hmm. And so imagine who you have to compete against when you have meets here. Juniors, and that's, that's another thing. When you get to meet, Maybe there's like five of you in one age category. So they combine you with another age category to make it count. And so if you don't have at least three people in an event, guess what? Your mark does not, not count, count for yeah. anything. If you hit a, a maybe a standard, guess what? 
it probably won't count because you have to make sure sufficient persons are Wait, in. What? And it's been, so that's why we have to travel. We have no choice. If you're going to be in track and field home, it better be All something right. you want to do. I don't understand that one. <laughs> I'm telling you. I guess it's, it's an international standard, like X amount of competitors right. that are uh, for the meet. To, okay, to for the as, mark yeah. to come, it has mm-hmm. to have, it has to be, I guess, competition because Special yeah. Olympics has something similar, mm-hmm. and like for that, like so this a little background the Special Olympics, like how they do their heats and events, they tear them based on the score or time you could qualify with, mm-hmm. and if you don't have enough people in a certain group meeting a certain mark, then they'll either bump them up or bump them down to a different mm-hmm. score. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're telling me. Plenty of records get broken and they just don't go. Probably, probably, we just don't know. More than likely, that happens that way. Or if it's win assisted, it doesn't count for sure. But definitely, if there's not a, enough um, persons in the van, it's not going to count. So immediately, when my coach sees the lineup, he'll say, "Okay, he'll watch like the number of people coming in." And he said, "If it, if it makes sense, we're going to jump. If not, use the practice me because we have to stay in shape. If we're actually going for." Uh, um, a, a standard of qualification. We don't. I don't do it because what sense is gonna make? It's not. Yeah. It's not gonna come. I have to go away to make my um, efforts count. And triple jump ain't a long jump. It ain't like a one hundred dash. We just. It's 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 a lot on the body, and so we have yeah. to make every effort and jump <clears throat> count. What does it take to put on a meet? So why you know the government mm-hmm. doesn't have to do it. So. Mm-hmm. Why don't like privatize? That's a good question. So I'm gonna be fair in what I say. Um, it it apparently it does it is expensive, and I guess what the clubs are being charged to um host a meet um from to paying the backo officials to making sure the equipment is maintained, up and running. Um, all the officials like I mentioned before, and so I think, and depending on the number, but the number of athletes coming in, I think offset what the clubs pay. But I just think they need to make just plan how they're gonna have the meets because it, it needs it needs to happen. Um and once they have the meet, just ensure that um moving forward, even if you stagger it, if it's too, if it's too expensive, stagger it maybe one month, one meet a month, like Jamaica would have like all comers meet. It, they would have at least two meets per month. And I I had to go to Jamaica at some point as well to compete in meets because they always have a meet. But I wish we could do that here. Um I don't understand how expensive it would be. But I understand it is costly sometimes, so that might play a factor in um why we don't have sufficient meat. But something has to change so that we can ensure everybody training home gets a fair chance of, you know, becoming the athlete that they need, that they know they can be. But we won't have that chance if we don't have the meats to showcase that. So I don't know. Got to be some give and take. That was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have one famous tradition with our last question. What are you most fanatical about at this time? Uh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess you, in terms of track and field or just anything at all. Anything. Anything. I love my dogs. I have two fur babies. Um, okay. Right. Charlie and Shelly. Right. Um, obviously, they can't watch us right now. But <laughs> if they could, they'd be proud of their mama. Um, they can see yeah. it on TV. Yeah. Or mobile or anything. You know, so <laughs> that gives me a joy to go home and see their wagging tails after a long, tough day. Because between work and training and my phone being off, I don't need any other distractions between who loves me when I get home. So, but I mean, it, it helps in cheering me up and um, um, just enlightening my day when they're having a tough day. And they have tough days all the time. So, yeah, that's what I'm fanatic about. Shout out to the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Good All stuff. Right. All right. So we just want to say thank you for, you know, coming in to the studio first and foremost and also enlightening us on some of the things that you go through as a track and field athlete and athletes in the bombers um, go through as well. Guys, if you haven't or if you're not already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and let us know what we can. Let us know if there's any guests that you want us to bring on, any questions, you, any guests that you want us to bring back. If you're watching on YouTube, um, you know, like I say, like any of the audio platforms, give us a five-star review. And until next time, see you later.